Wow, this is an incredible venue. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's uh, one of the first ones after a long, long break. <laughs> and I have to come here and play with my band one time. We'll see. <laughs> All right, so um, Igor Mezik, I'm here to talk about uh, AI and cybersecurity. If you can't hear me back there or you can't see something, please let me know. I'll try to explain a little better uh, what's over there. I'm. Uh, Still a professor in engineering at, at University of California in Santa Barbara, and then uh, I'm chief scientist and CTO at, at, at Mixmode. And indeed, we have strived to uh, include some of the aspects of uh, artificial intelligence AI in cybersecurity. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm I'm going to largely talk non-specific to the kinds of things that we have uh, applied, but. If you have any questions on the product or anything like that, please ask me later. This is going to be non-vendor specific. I'm going to try to give you a, an impression of where AI is today in general, uh, where it stands in cybersecurity, and what types of AI we might consider uh, in cybersecurity. And the topic seems <laughs> important. The reason being that there is a lot of discussion of artificial intelligence in general. There is also a lot of discussion of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity in particular. May I say there is a lot of hype and get, a lot, get some smiles. So I'm, I'm going to try to, to go, you know, to, to circumvent that hype and try to kind of describe what the approaches are maybe point out to you some of the things that work and don't work. And I'm going to start by telling you a bit about the plan of the talk and then, and then, uh, and then describe kind of the situation. You, you might have encountered this uh, acronym SPIN, the Situation, Problem, Implication, Needs. So I'm going to try to go through this to connect the AI needs that we have to the situation that we have in cybersecurity today. So I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Now I'm going to describe the artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning. Uh, many of you in the room might already know the difference, but it's, it's something that is sometimes a little bit confusing. I'm going to talk about a rule-based system. If, if you're already working in cybersecurity, if you're an analyst, you have already encountered those. They're not new to you. Um, then I'll talk a bit about statistical second way machine learning. A very, very important topic, which is false positives versus false negatives. What are they and how can we, in general, avoid them? And you will see that the uh, solution seems to lie in something that's called contextual AI. And then something that we see on our screens all the time in cybersecurity, but maybe not think about as much, which is time series and how the data kind of um, evolves in time. The reason why this is important is that any regression type approach cannot really capture causality. Yes, I said it. So if you have, if you have any graphs that are showing the relationship between this variable and that observable, they, they show you the correlation. The fact that I woke up at, you know, today at 6 o'clock my time and had coffee, those two, uh, those two things are correlated. But the fact that I uh, woke up at six o'clock, and, uh, and the network traffic on my computer started up because, uh, and I had coffee at the same time. Having coffee and increased traffic on your computer are not correlated, right? They're not. So, correlation is not causation. I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit in, in this context and why we need time series. Uh, the reason I'm spending a little bit of time on that in the intro is that it is important to what we do today. We understand that causality can only be captured if we understand the time flows. And that's an essential part of the approach that we have. And then I'll talk about generative models, which are fundamentally based on these time series. And then some fun and games. I'll, I'll talk about how can one infer a network structure um, automatically from, uh, from, uh, from this type of AI approach. And then something that is not necessarily immediately related to network security, but it is something that we have done in the past, and that is an application to online games. So I hope some of you might enjoy that. All right. So uh, let me kind of lay out the situation the way I see it, the, 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 the way um, you know, 
people that I also work with um, see and talk a little bit about cybersecurity in the context of uh, situation, problem, implication, need. Um, it, what, what we see today is that the software space is dominated by solutions providing data collection for compliance. And that's great. We, we absolutely need that. But to a large extent, there is no pattern extraction. There is no underlying intelligence that is actually getting that data out um, at, at a large scale. Um, all of you here in this room are cybersecurity professionals. And I'm sure you know the number. We are lacking millions and millions of people in this field um, worldwide, and so that's not going to go away. Um, and then I'm going to describe pretty carefully the first and second wave solutions in AI. Um, one of the aspects of the situation is that our tools use the first and second A, uh, wave AI tools, rules and statistical solutions. I'm going to argue, hopefully successfully, that we need some of this uh, third wave contextual reasoning type tools. And once again, I'm going to describe what this means in, in some detail, some detail as I go. So that's the situation. What's the problem? You could say, well, you know, if the amount of data collected is, is relatively small, we, we wouldn't really have a problem, but that's not true, the, the amount of data collected is absolutely massive. Um, in your experience, you've probably already seen the, the amount of uh, false positives and unfortunately false negatives. Uh, false positives are really taxing, I'll, I'll give you some statistics, but false positives are, uh, are, are very, very damaging. False positives are also damaging. All right, number three is quite important. Threat actors are not only starting, but using AI in their own activities more and more. That is going to I'll make a prediction, exponentially increase in the next few years. We are in an unfortunate situation geopolitically in which cybersecurity has become, I'm going to become a little grave now uh, because I, I do think the situation is, is bad. Um, the nation states have started putting massive amounts of resources into threats. That was not the case before. What that means is they can use any AI that their countries are producing to hurt us. That's just what it is. And it's going to continue and it's going to be really bad. And the fact that they're using AI, well, you know, the famous Proverbially, we can't fight that with sticks. So we need, we need to have the tools that uh, enable us to, 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 fight, to fight back. You might have noticed that very few products out there have a systematic ranking of threats. That's a lack of AI, really. So humans are extremely, you know, are extremely good at uh, ranking threats. We're extremely good at sifting through what is dangerous to us and what, what is not. We don't have tools out there that, um, that, uh, that do that for us uh, yet. And then I talked about regression and correlation. Uh, we, we really, <clears throat> what would be ideal in, in cybersecurity, right? Ideally, you could tell an attack by just some kind of a network behavior that is happening out there without the, the, the threat actor ever coming into our network, right? Even coming close. That's ideal. So prediction is really ideal, if you think about it. Everything else is secondary. I'd argue that we have very close to 0% application of predictive capabilities of modern science that we see in products, right? It's, it's a problem. So, what are the modern threats? APTs. This is related to nation states. Uh, hackers from uh, organizations like that like to hang in our systems for a long time and then do damage when, when, they, when they desire to do so. Zero day, the unknown ones. I would actually say, you know, the statistic is statistic, so I think 80% of successful uh, attacks are from, from zero day. But that also means that we took really good care of the ones that can be detected by signatures, right? If it's 
But that's the place where the cybersecurity products need to be. And, and, and the place where they can detect zero threats to reduce that margin and, and, and APTs. Um, cybersecurity teams, because of false positives and other aspects of what I've, what I've talked about, are definitely overworked trying to overcome in, inadequacies of tools. That's one of the major kind of um, themes. Threat actors are actually gaining ground because of all the lack of of, uh, of analysts and the lack of tools. And, uh, and uh, the detection of causality is actually not something that is systematized. We do it when we go after threats, right? We, 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 we look for causality and we don't seem, at, at least I haven't seen many tools. I mean, obviously, you know, we're trying to develop some, but I have not seen many tools that actually give us the ability to, 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 to with high precision detect causality in, 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 in threats, progression. All right, so I'm gonna summarize here and say, what, what are the needs? Um, I'll talk about supervised versus unsupervised AI, so there are a lot of words here for those of you that haven't seen artificial intelligence aspects before that, that maybe don't mean too much, but I will define them as I go. So unsupervised AI, that just means that it, it can work without human intervention, it just kind of goes and, and learns on its own. Uh, because the data is massive, that's one of the problems that I identified, the data is massive, we cannot label it all. It's, it's not possible to label all the data. Um, AI frameworks that can actually detect causality, that can detect progression of, of, of threats. The solutions that perform automated threat ranking would, would do things, things simpler, simpler for us. And then, Last but not least, many machine learning algorithms out there can be easily spoofed. And that's a problem, because in that particular context, we're going to, if, if our algorithms get spoofed, we might get the, uh, the false negative rates going up. All right, so that's the summary of, of where we are. But let me now go to, to some of the technical stuff, except if anyone has any questions at, at this point, as far as the summary is concerned. If not, I'm going to happily assume that all of you agree with what I just said. <laughs> and move on. Okay. So, there is often a question as to what is AI versus what is uh, machine learning versus what is deep learning. And very often, deep learning today is conflated with AI. So it's, it's thought of as being, being the same. But this I found to be an interesting set of descriptions that correspond to what I think. Um, so artificial intelligence is just a technique which enables machines to mimic human behavior. Many of you knew, know about Turing tests. I don't, particularly agree with the Turing test, which basically says, well, if you put something behind the curtain and you talk to it and it responds like a human, then it's intelligence, it's just maybe artificial intelligence. We can do Turing test machines today relatively easily. They, you know, they can be very sophisticated parrots because we can just process very large amounts of data. So I don't think that's all. So there's <coughs> a, true, a true test for artificial intelligence would be really that the reasoning is also capable of handling curveballs and you know, doing all kinds of things that humans do very, very well, recognition of, of, of deception and that sort of stuff, which is much more important in cybersecurity. So I'd argue we need a new Turing test. But uh, putting that aside, and what is machine learning? Machine learning is a set of mathematical algorithms that, um, that use methods to enable the machine performance to mimic human behavior. So machine learning is the underlying set of algorithms now, I, you know, uh, 30 years of career in, in science, so I, I've been building algorithms for a very, very long time. And this whole thing about AI happened in the last 10, 15 years. Of course, there were researchers even in the 80s when I was, in, you know, when I was a student that, that were doing this. And I'll show you some history um, of that. But the, 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 we tend to call almost everything AI today. And I, I think that's, that's a bit unfair to 
the general scope of algorithms. Algorithms are very, very, very important, even if they're not used in AI. I'll make a little pitch for that. Uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning methodologies, and it's a particularly successful one for recognition of images. If you use your iPhone, it recognizes your face, you know, a variety of other um, static recognition tasks, or even, even in, in, in speech, although a little bit less, to tell you the truth. The good old Fourier methods are still really good in, in speech recognition and are still being used. Uh, but deep learning is a particular set of algorithms that are very, very good, and I like them for various particular technical reasons, but they are a subset of machine learning. There are many ways of putting these together in artificial intelligence. And, uh, and deep learning is one of those. I don't think you'll be able to see this very well in the, in the back. There is no way. So I'll tell you. It's the history of AI. It's kind of the, the timeline between the, the, the 1940s when the war effort spurred a lot of the development, algorithmic development that we would call AI. Right after the war, there was a, <clears throat> a massive amount of funding injected into these kinds of ideas, and they basically went along two lines. One was rule-based, that was Marvin Minsky at MIT, and the other one was Perceptron and what turned out today to be the neural network approach. Guess which one won? No. Originally, in the 60s. Anybody? The rules? The neural network. Rules. Rules won, and there was a very nasty fight. It's actually kind of fun for all of us that are in this field to take a look at what the, what the history was. It was a very, very nasty scientific fight as to you know, what is right and what is wrong. Now, of course, today no one, no one would suspect that because deep learning just dominates everything. But the idea was that human intelligence is about, is about logic, and logic is about rules, and therefore rules is what intelligence is. And so we had expert systems somewhere somewhere in the 80s, but the people on the other side, on the neural network side, they didn't stop either, although they didn't have any funding, so they invented something that's called backpropagation. Backpropagation is a nice way, this is going to sound funny and simple to you, but it's a nice way of differentiating. How far can you get with knowing kind of first, you know, uh, junior high school year calculus? <laughs> <laughs> Science. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. Neural networks are, are, you know, deep networks, and you need to differentiate the cost function, something that you want to optimize, in order to find out how to update the coefficients in it. And so, if you have a massive network, differentiating with respect to all these different variables that you have is a very, very hard thing. So, please don't, my, don't tell my friends that do back propagation that I that I joked about it a little bit. But it is really a very, very sophisticated method in, in, uh, in differentiation. I'm also trying to point out how interesting you know, the aspects of mathematics that go into this are and who, you know, what are the kinds of things that went into this kind of, this kind of a development. <coughs> so uh, the, the whole backpropagation idea exploded in about 2005. Uh, Jeff Hinton and, and Russell Akudinov um, wrote this particular algorithm, published it in Nature, I think, and then the thing exploded, absolutely exploded. About t between 2006 and today, you have seen just the win of the deep neural network approach to AI, so deep neural networks as, as, as AI. And, and here we are today, a lot of debates, everybody talks about it in positive or negative terms, we are talking about uh, defining general intelligence and whether it's dangerous to us and all these things, I'm going to stay completely away from that, <laughs> from that discussion because I think if we apply it correctly in a particular area where our adversaries are applying it in a, in a, in a, in a threatening way, uh, we're going to stay on the good side and, and, and get some uh, benefit out of it. All right, so uh, I've already mentioned the, the three waves. Um, a lot of this research has been funded by uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project uh, Agency, uh, that also, of course, gave us internet and transistors. And so this is their classification as to what the waves of, of AI really are. So what you're seeing on the graphs on the left is the different types of um, uh, features 
that an AI system should have. And they are perceiving, that is really kind of taking the data and finding the patterns. Your eyes don't, you know, it, your eyes don't take into account every photon that comes into, into it. There are massive numbers of photons that come. But try to select the edges and the features. So that's perception, right? The, the, the initial, uh, the initial um, um, kind of processing of data. Then learning, and we learn the relationships. Then abstraction, can the learned relationships be abstracted to maybe even get transferred to another place where the learning is going to be made easier? And then reasoning. Reasoning really is about logic, about rules, and that's what Minsky originally thought um, um, uh, the, the, the right thing might be. And, you know, if you take a look at the, at the right side, right side over there, one reason why rules were so attractive early on is that we didn't have a very large computational capability. So writing if then statements and and statements and or statements and XOR and all, all of this was not foreign to the way we would do computing at the time. Right? So the learning, right? So statistical functional approximation and those systems, the deep deep uh, deep neural network is on the right. What you're seeing on the left is the inputs, x1 to xn, and then the outputs, y1 to yn. So and in the meantime, there is this processing thing that tries to connect the input and the output. One example could be, in cybersecurity, a larger outgoing file, right? Is that a threat or not? So you give it large amounts of data that shows some files that are, that are actually part of exfiltration and other parts that are not part of exfiltration. And, uh, and, uh, and the deep neural network, given massive amounts of information about which one is threatening and which one is not, is going to be able to recognize with some precision what happens next. As I, and as I have described this process, you have probably been thinking about problems in it and already, already see it. Well, what if my network changes? And suddenly somebody's sending files that you know they didn't send yesterday, but it's completely legit because maybe they are part of another organization and the false positive comes and that's a problem. The, the, the method that I've just described is called a supervised method. You give the system a lot of inputs and connected outputs, and you're expecting it to learn on its own the relationship between inputs and outputs. It does have to extract features. This is what these intermediate layers are, are for. And uh, it's very good at perceiving, therefore, and learning. But it has very little ability of abstraction and reasoning. Right? And so, to a certain extent, I've described problems with both. Rules are very, very rigid and they're just at the reasoning level. Statistical methods, they have very good very good um, ability to learn, but they can't really reason. There is no reasoning aspect to them. So this bottom layer here is something that DARPA called the third wave AI, in the meantime invested a really serious amount of money in it, and we are getting somewhere with that uh, investment. And that context contextual adaptation. Let me just go to large outbound file um, um, alert. Yeah. If a five meg file goes out of an organization in the middle of the day, it is very, very different than the same size file going out at three o'clock at night in an organization that shuts down at six o'clock in the afternoon and people largely go home. Context is important, right? And, and, and unfortunately, the first and the second wave um, systems have little ability to recognize, recognize context. I could say, well, I could make a deep learner figure out what the context is, right? I could label the data by saying day and night. Sure, yes, you can, but that requires a lot of your work. And so how about another piece of context and another piece of context and start counting dimensions, right, of those various pieces. Is it the weekend? I mean, Start counting dimensions, they're pretty soon in large numbers of dimensions that you can't, com well, forget that you can't compute. You, you, you can't gather, aggregate the data, clean it up, ETL, right, and put it in in order for it to be processed. So 
The, the third wave systems are really in this diagram on the left, which I'm sure also is pretty dim. Um, so perceive and learn leads to development of a contextual model, so that's an algorithm in the middle, that then enables the system to abstract and, and, and reason. And in the best of all worlds, this happens without human help, right? So without any input from us, without any input from analysts. Uh, we don't want to waste time on that, we just want to give the AI system the ability to learn and get the reasoning out of it as to what exactly happened. Okay, so let's talk about rules and see that some rules are of course really, really good. There is, there is no problem with many different rules that I actually call masks, right? If you are trying to put in permits uh, uh, for incoming connections to, to, to a VM, and that's a particular sub mask that you want to put on, that's perfectly fine, you should do it. There is, there is in principle, no reason to have a, a, a self-learning AI do that. Except that you might want the self-learning AI to watch whether the permits have been given correctly or whether any of these connections is doing something weird, zero trust, right? So I'll, I'll go to zero trust for a second. It's very interesting to me, and of course things are, you know, the, the, the dual factor authentication and things like that are making our lives better, but we feel more secure. Well, I mean, <laughs> joke about it a little bit. Well, I just said it, right? We feel more secure, like taking off shoes at, at the airport. <coughs> Remember, <laughs> a massive percentage of attacks are actually coming from inside threats. So if you think about it, there is, there is very few things, very few real threats that this dual factor authentication actually captures in a sense. So it makes us feel secure. The real zero threat system should tell us that if something that's going on on the network is unusual, not normal, even if the person has all the credentials in the world. So I would pause it, maybe this is a little bit radical, but all of the things that we're hearing about zero threat today out there are really about authentication and those kinds of methods. Fine, I'm never opposed to providing another layer of security. But let's think about what really helps in this situation. What helps in this situation is trying to weed out the abnormal behavior and that perception of something unusual happening, which is, for many of you that are analysts, exactly what you're doing, right? So the human intelligence, again, is very good at this aspect of perception. We should get AI to help us more in that aspect that, so that we, 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 we can be more, more effective in it. Anyhow, so there are good rules. There are also bad ones. I covered the vendor because I don't want you to know who it is. But look at this rule. Large outbound transfer by high-risk user. Okay, so you have to determine who a high-risk user is, fine. And then you say, detects an outbound transfer of 200,000 bytes or more for a high-risk user. What is 200,000 bytes to you? How does that get determined? Well, okay, it's the threshold. You can move it back and forth. But every time the network configuration changes, that's the thing that needs to be somehow adjusted, adapted. So the maintenance, the amount of maintenance that, that one is having in these systems that we're getting is forcing organization to hire more and more machine learning people, which, great, you know, I'm a machine learning person, <laughs> awesome. But think about it. It's, uh, it's not core cybersecurity, is it? Right? The, 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 the data analysis. It's becoming a large part of it, but of course we need an overlap there. And of course, again, we are going to have a problem with uh, needing to educate more and more people that have <coughs> background in both. And there are not many to come by at this point in time. I'm sure many of you in this room 
do have it. What I'm saying is out there, that is not common, right? So that's the problem that we faced with, with rules. So machine learning, um, this is uh, from, from a, a really nice paper. I, I, if, if you have an interest in this, I, I really urge you to, to read it. It's on the top left. If you uh, want to find it and can, um, send me an email and I'll, I'll, point, it, I'll point, point it to you. So the statistical machine learning gets split today in what is called the shallow learning. That is not, uh, it's not trying to put, well, I don't know, maybe the inventors of this word actually did want to put it down. But shallow learning, these methods are actually really, really good for some aspects. And then deep learning, I've already described a little bit deep learning. But deep learning is, consists of layers. You put in some inputs and you have some outputs and you want to connect them through a sequence of layers that extract features, so they perceive, right? So, you know, supervised and unsupervised shallow learning. Supervised would be this situation in which <clears throat> we give the machine learning some inputs and outputs, we label them, and then it learns. Unsupervised, we don't give them anything. So, for example, unsupervised would be you just get a bunch of data, large files, small files, and you're trying to determine what is a large file based on some threshold, what is a small file, and you cluster them into groups. So clustering is one of the methodologies in, in, in unsupervised learning. And you have deep learning, and I'm not going to read through all the different, different approaches that are on the right. There are, there are many. They're all algorithmic. Um, it, but I will say something about where they have been applied in network security, right? So this is for specific cybersecurity, um, um, cybersecurity threats. And here we have intrusion detection, malware analysis, and, and, and spam detection. Under intrusion detection, I have network, botnets, uh, domain generation. And you're seeing, so the, the, the pattern that you're seeing in this table is that shallow learning has been deployed quite a bit for all of these from left to right. What you're seeing is that deep learning has not yet, right? So it's a newer, newer methodology, and it's getting, getting deployed. Um, as we as we speak, so uh, <laughs> this is a little joke on, on, on deep learning, but it's actually a factual example. So, one of the aspects of deep learning that is not so uh, savory for for us in cybersecurity is the fact that it can be easily spoofed. This is a well well known. Uh, I'm not trying to trash it or anything. It's a well well known feature. This is an example that actually happened. So uh, a, a deep learning network was supposed to recognize a panda. <coughs> and it recognizes panda superbly, right? No false positives. And then you add 1% noise, this thing. A really tiny amount of noise on top of this. And, and, network, and, and the AI says, given. With 99.3% with confidence. There is a given on the top, on the top right. So this is something that we call the instability in machine learning, in the sense that with very, very small amounts of input, we can perturb the AI system to give us, uh, a, in this case, a false negative, something that would be very dangerous, very dangerous to us. Our, 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 uh, our um, you know, analogies would be a, a um, non-threatening actor versus a, a, a threatening actor in this case. All right, so that is the problem. So I, I spoke about false positives and false negatives, so let's try and define them a, a little bit and see where the problems are. So <clears throat> the, this table says true and false and positive and negative, so a true positive is there is a threat <coughs> existing and you detect it. A, a false positive is, of course, um, there is no threat and you still detect it. So I'm, I'm hearing this commercial on the radio these days that yeah, this is a, a person of my age uh, thinks about these things. A particular cancer gets detected by, by, a, uh, by a test and they say 92% of the time, it, it, it tells you whether you have 
whether you have kinds of it, it gives you um, a, a result. It's like, okay, w w what is it really? Because if, if people walk by me and I tell them, you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer, that's 100%, I'll catch everybody who has the disease, you know, although there might be only one or two people that have it. All of the rest are the false positives. And unfortunately, this happens to us in, in cybersecurity a lot. The alerts themselves contain a lot of a lot of false positives. So here is some quote from Bitdefender. It says, uh, 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 close to half of security analysts teams battle false positive rates of 50% of higher. So people are spending, what, 25% of their time just trying to figure out something that is um, uh, pretty much a rabbit hole, right? It's not. A good, a good situation. All right, so <clears throat> mathematically, there's a little bit of math. Uh, mathematically, what are false, how, how can you compute those? So let's, say, let's go with large outbound file transfer and say, okay, if I have a large file and it's malicious, <clears throat> I'm going to give it a one. Y is equal to one. If I have a large, large file and it's not malicious, I'm going to give it, give it a zero. So a distribution of files, and you're looking at them, and every time a malicious one comes up, you say one. And so you have a, you have a distribution over the size that's on the horizontal, the distribution over the size of these files, right? So if it's five megabytes, this is how many malicious ones I have. If it's 50 megabytes, it's how many malicious ones I have. And then you calculate, you put a threshold, this thing here is the threshold, and you calculate how much do you have to the right of that threshold, and that is going to give you the true positives, right? Now, the other distribution is, well, I have a file of this size, and I, I said it's, uh, it's malicious, but it's not. So that's a false positive, right? So that's another distribution. You say, okay, how many of those do I have? Well, here is another distribution. Just integrate to the right and say, if, if that amount is very tiny, that's, that's great. I have very few false positives. Here's the problem. Large outbound file transfer, right? a very flat distribution. Like, if, if the file is going out at three o'clock at night, as I said, it's five megabytes, eh, you know, probability might be that it's malicious, or at least might be larger than at five o'clock in the afternoon. I'll literally prove this to you with data on the next slide. So, so the trouble is that <coughs> these kinds of systems have, well, this is maybe, maybe too much, you know, no skill, but they have this very flat curve on the false positive, true positive, um, true positive graph. And you really want to be up here, where your true positives are 100% and your false positives are zero. The rule-based systems, because of the nature of the network, because of the lack of context, day, night, all of these things, have a very straight line which basically tells you that if you randomly picked, randomly, whether this is a malicious thing or not, yeah, you will get, you will get the same, same result. Now, once again, it is better than that straight line. I'm not saying it's exactly that straight line, but unfortunately, it's pretty low in that quadrant on the top, on the top left. Um, here is some data. So on the vertical, you're seeing the number of bytes. On the horizontal, you're seeing time. And what you're seeing in, uh, in uh, green, I don't know if you can see this well, but it's the large outbound file transfer alert on a particular system. So as a human analyst, your eyes immediately tell you that during the Saturday, Sunday, I have no alert popping up. As soon as Monday hits, Tuesday, Wednesday, I have large outbound file transfer alerts popping up like crazy. The, the alert is telling you, yeah, the alert is telling you nothing. It's just telling you that the overall, that the overall volume of data, because that's on the vertical, that the overall volume of data is larger. That's all. When the overall volume of data is small, it's not giving you, giving you an alert. So that's what happens. Uh, 
This does a little bit better. This is from some work that we have done on what is called generative models. So what the generative models try to do is capture the patterns in the data, and then they capture the deviation from that pattern. So what you're seeing is that, you know, that orange thing is now the trend through the data. And so what is the trend? People come up, come into work in the morning at 9 o'clock, traffic goes up. Stays relatively flat, <coughs> as you've seen from the previous data, and then drops at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Right? So that's a trend. And then the rest of it, when am I sending emails out? When am I getting emails and files and transfers from somebody else? That's pretty random. So, but I need to, I need a way to qualify the random, right? I need that spread that's shown in green. But if I can, I have a very good way informed by context, context in this case being time, to determine whether something is in normal or abnormal, abnormal bounds. So for example, if it's outside of that green, which tells me you know, the random deviation around my trend, then it might be high risk and might go hunting. It'd be great if the AI gives me also all the information around that so that I can know what happened there, so it does some reasoning. But that's basically the type of model that we need to that we need to um, uh, keep developing. Uh, it has perception, so it figures out trends from the data. It learns those trends, right? It abstracts them out because the way it does it on one stream of data, it can do on another. Forget large outbound file transfer, I can just measure the bytes coming in and out of the system, right? An inbound or outbound um, transfer. I could, I could give it a stream of data that, that measures, you know, authentication attempts. No difference. The abstract template of the method is exactly the same. And then it has ability to reason over that. Well, if that happened, if a user was created and I try the user and the user is doing something very, very unusual, well, then you should really go and figure out, you know, what files are being taken out of the system and and all of this other contextual stuff. So some reasoning to get me at least to the point where I can do my job very, very effectively if I'm looking for, for some, uh, some, some level of intrusion. So um, there are other things you can do. Again, this is very dim, but this is IPs on the horizontal and IPs on the vertical, and this is one of the patterns that the AI extracted from the network. And you can clearly see that the IPs on the bottom right talk to the IPs on the top, on the, on the vertical left, right? And vice versa. This is automatic detection of the, of the talk patterns between the parts of the network. In fact, you can quite effectively get the, the ranges, IP ranges, in there automatically, and the, the, the human analyst can, can uh, I'll go just a little bit, maybe a couple of minutes of the time. So, all right, uh, this is some math that enables you to do that. I'll skip it. If anybody is interested, uh, I, will, I will talk about it. Uh, it is something that is from our own, own internal research, and I will, uh, I will um, challenge you here and say, hey, the top is what our system detected uh, in, in a particular uh, set of data to be the normal behavior. Horizontal is time, top is data, right? That's the normal behavior pattern with the trend, which you can probably see with your eyes, right in the middle, right? Kind of oscillating. And then all the noise around it. And the bottom has, uh, has uh, an injection of malicious data. Where was it injected? So the top and bottom, I know, the top and bottom are actually different. Where was it injected? Hopefully... <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is, that is the correct answer. I hope you couldn't, you know, you couldn't figure it out with your eyes. Actually, what our director of engineering at the time 
figured it out and I don't know how. <laughs> I'm thinking it's a wild guess, so Joe Zuli actually figured it out. But it's in uh, intervals four and five, and what you're seeing in red is the risk scores for intervals four and five on this particular set of data. They are nine, uh, eight and 10. For everything else, the risk scores are on the right. For everything else, the risk scores are very, very tiny. One, two, and the meaning of that, actually, by the way, it does have a semantic meaning. So it means that the AI system that is doing this has 90 plus percent confidence that it's in these intervals, right? So it does have a semantic meaning, and uh, from that perspective, those are the things that need to be kind of coupled to other aspects of the AI and uh, reasoned over and, uh, and uh, hunted. And so my pitch is for these kinds of uh, uh, approaches where we get data, create a generative model, I've shown you one, a reason over it, well, get data again. Do we have success? Did we correctly predict? Did we correctly match? Did we correctly diminish the threat? If yes, well, we could label it. We could say, this is what I've just seen. But note that there is no labeling in advance. And that's a little bit more like parenting, isn't it? Something walks by and a toddler knows well, it has four legs, you know, head, whiskers. It's something. They call it something in their head, and the parent comes by and says, a cat. And then a tiger walks by, it's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the dangerous one. Different classification. But the point <laughs> is, the true artificial intelligence is, is about, you know, labeling after the fact, not prior to the fact, and that's causing a lot of our problems, besides the false positives, the false negatives, and everything else. Uh, you might be uh, amused that we have actually applied this to st Anybody playing this game out there? All right, so you're not going to be happy that we, that we were able to win. So let me, let me say something about this. Uh, uh, a, a lot of... Um, uh, hype has been uh, associated with the fact that today, you know, uh, chess players even cheat. There's, if you're following chess, there is a big brouhaha right now with Carlson, um, where you know somebody else is supposed to be cheating and this and that because they use they use uh, they use uh, artificial intelligence. But those are actually think about it. You're all in cybersecurity. Those are easy games. They're not chess. Is predefined. There is a set of rules, and if you can compute seven steps ahead, you're going to win. And computers can compute seven steps ahead. That's it. There's no real... I, I don't want to be dismissing, but... The, no, the, there is no intelligence, artificial intelligence of the type that I have described, right? That actually constantly gets data, constantly reforms, it, constantly adapts. A new player might come in, a, a player might free will, a player might decide to just do you know, and, and put in another, or, or rather, upgrade their, their weaponry or whatever. Online games are much more interesting that way, and so we, uh, we, we, we played with this one, and when we uh, got the generative model, what, what you're seeing on the bottom is kind of a criterion for the goodness, how, how good our AI was in recognizing the patterns. On the vertical, you're seeing, um, you're seeing, uh, so, sorry, on the vertical is how good uh, is, is the prediction from the, the, the pattern recognition AI. And on the horizontal is from playing the game. So you see that <coughs> the line is pretty diagonal, right? So the two were the same. So the model was able to capture what's going on, on, the, on, the, on in, in the game in the same way it captures what's going on in the, in, in the network and I couldn't resist. Let's see if this is going to play. Maybe not. If the move is, oh, I, I couldn't resist to show you this soft robotic arm that we also train. So this is not network security, but I, uh, <laughs> this is from my lab. And so we, we just kind of randomly perturb it like a small child sort of uh, wiggles their arms, you know, to figure out what they can do with them. And then after a while, we gave it a task, and we gave it a task to follow a stick. So this is, this is even beyond recognizing and reasoning. This is about controlling and making the system do a specific task in our case, context, in cybersecurity, for example, 
actively playing against the intruders. Instead, there was a threat activism. Maybe you're seeing this, but there is a stick being shown to it, and it's carefully just moving around and, 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 and following, following the stick. So you can do quite a bit with these generative models. I hope nobody is developing any attachment to the soft robotic arm because humans are known <laughs> to do that to inanimate objects when something like this happens, when it behaves like, um, like a species. But anyhow, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the final of it. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that we do need um, a particular brand of AI in order to uh, advance our posture, security posture. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that this, uh, uh, this includes getting in some novel types of algorithms and AI that, that avoid some of the problems that we had in the past. It's very interesting to me that the algorithms that we are talking about are actually constantly doing predictions as to what's going to happen. They get data, they compare that, and they say, oh, this is, com this is normal because I've already created a model that tells me that that's normal. Versus, oh, no, this is abnormal, I'm going to give it a risk. There's a book that I highly recommend, it's called A Thousand Brain, in which the author, who, by the way, uh, was the home pilot uh, uh, designer, if anybody remembers that. There are many, many people here, and I'm very glad about that, but don't remember that, <laughs> because they're way too young <laughs> to remember it. But a few of you might. Um, uh, there's this interesting book that says that our brains do that all the time, and so you know, we've strived to develop these methodologies that do a very, very similar, very similar thing. And then, you know, just, just last as like, what kind of questions should there be for anybody saying, I have AI in my, in my system that is actually helping you out. When the system is figuring out normal versus abnormal, is the baseline dependent on clustering, labeling, human intervention? Who is responsible for the, for the, for, for the training and for, for, for maintenance? Are you going to have to hire a lot of people that are responsible for the maintenance? How does the system behave if the rules are completely turned off? Does it actually have any perception and learning abilities without that? And, uh, and, uh, and how does it respond to zero-day zero day attacks? I think those are kind of the important things to to think about in the context, and as I said, I hope I convinced you that we do have some solutions either already there or, or coming up that uh, the AI community has worked on and now is deploying in cybersecurity that, uh, that all of you can either develop further or use. So uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention.